All right, well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to our Wake Up With Wildlife lecture all about raptors today. I am joined with one of our wonderful Project Wildlife volunteers, Andy Shooker. Um, he do, does have a few friends behind him that we'll meet later on in the lecture. Um, we'll go over a few of the housekeeping notes, you guys. If you have any questions during the lecture, just go ahead and throw them in that Q&A box. And um, I will let Andy know that we have some questions for him, but we'll probably hold those off until the end of the lecture. And then um, if anyone is interested in signing up for next month in December, we are going to have our veterinarian, Dr. John Inyert. He's gonna be talking about a few case studies that have come through this past year, um, some wildlife interventions, some do's and don'ts on how to help coexist with some local wild animals. So make sure to sign up for that lecture. That'll be a really interesting one um, from our wildlife veterinarian. But a quick little introduction for Andy here is that he has about over 30 years of experience of informal education, including 22 years in wildlife education. He has worked with a large variety of raptors from the tiny four ounce African pygmy falcons to golden eagles. Andy has been involved in all the manner of care of the raptors, including the rehabilitation, long-term housing, and training of our education ambassadors. So we're so lucky that we have him here with us today. Um, and Andy, I am gonna let you take it away from here. Okay, thank you so much, Carly. Um, hello, everybody. Um, just a couple of housekeeping things to help you out and enjoy this presentation a little bit more. I've got a slideshow I'm gonna be doing. We'll jump out of that for a chance to meet the birds and then um, we'll jump back in and out. So what I'm gonna recommend you do is you can, should be able to see my cursor, I hope. You go up here under view and it says speaker view, click on speaker view. That's gonna give you the full view of um, me and the screen. And when we have the animals out, you'll be able to see the animals. Um, also, um, when I do pop up uh, with my, my presentation, you'll have the option up here to uh, minimize my video. You don't need to see me, I'm just gonna be sitting here. So um, if you minimize my image, then you get to see the full PowerPoint. You won't have my little video screen in the corner. So with that in mind, um, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. And... All right, let's talk a little bit about Birds of Prey of San Diego. Um, as Carly said, thank you all so much for being here. I really, uh, really appreciate you coming out this morning, out being in your house, of course, um, braving the weather because it is, well, it's sunny out here right now. It was raining hard just a moment ago. But anyways, we're gonna talk a little bit about Birds of Prey. So a little bit about me, Carly kind of introduced you to me and my background. Um, I'm a self-described bird nerd or bee geek. Um, I fell in love with raptors back in uh, middle school. Uh, I had a teacher who uh, was a falconer. He brought the birds to school one day, kind of end of the year. We didn't know what to do, so he brought his birds in. That got me hooked. And I've been interested in uh, birds of prey for a very, very long time. Uh, so I was fortunate enough, I do uh, work at the Safari Park in Escondido, but this is a picture of me with one of their animal ambassadors. It's a golden eagle. And uh, her name is Tonka, and Tonka is going to be our demonstration bird as we're talking about birds of prey um, throughout this session. So just a little bit about her, where she's from. A um, little bit of what we're talking about. So we're going to cover San Diego, uh, why it's important for birds of prey and other birds. Uh, a little bit about what is a bird of prey, some of the common traits. I'm going to drag you back to high school or uh, junior high, middle school. We're going to talk about phylogenetic classification for just a minute. And then we're going to dive into what uh, birds of prey we actually do have here in San Diego. All right, so before I go on to my next slide here, I want you to take just a second and think about San Diego, San Diego County proper. What is the very first thing that comes to your mind? Just take that thought, hold it in your head, um, and think for just a second. So I can't see you raising hands, but if you thought about the deserts, anybody think we have about our deserts here in San Diego County out here in Anzo Borrego? Did anybody think about the, the mountains here in San Diego County? Think about the snow, the winter storms. Uh, they're getting a dusting this weekend up there. So we go from the deserts in very short order up to a high altitude, the snow. 
And we've got our one wonderful inland valleys. This is uh, Mission Trails Regional Park. That's probably what a lot of us thought about is the San Diego brown habitat, brown vegetation. Uh, but some of you may have also thought about the beaches. So we've got some amazing habitats. We've got some very different environments, but we've also got some problems. And this is an older picture of Mission Valley. Uh, those of you who live here in San Diego um, and have been here for a while can remember seeing over the years Mission Valley um, changing and growing and developing. You can see uh, North Park and uh, Hillcrest there on the top part of the screen. Uh, my dad was here in the early 50s. He talked about uh, taking a day to drive from Miramar Naval Air Station to Coronado and back and driving through Mission Valley, which at the time was nothing but pasture land. So um, we've got a lot of amazing habitat, but we're also losing a lot of habitat. And we'll talk a little bit about why that's a, a big challenge for us here in San Diego in just a moment. Um, the reason we have so many different animals, different birds, um, is because San Diego does sit as part of the Pacific Flyway. Uh, this is the main migratory route on the Western North American continent. Um, we have, you can see it branches off uh, up in the kind of the Washington area with one route sticking close to the coast and another one going inland. That inland route actually passes through the Salton Sea area. So a lot of uh, birds are passing this way when they're migra migrating. Um, so with all of that diversity coming and going through here, we uh, need lots of different habitats, which is great why we have the deserts and the mountains and the inland valleys and the coast. Um, but with the loss of habitat, with all of the development, the urban sprawl that's happening, um, we're, our wildlife's in trouble. And in fact, San Diego has more endangered species than any other county in the contiguous United States. So we're not talking Alaska, we're not talking Hawaii, but within the, the 48 states, um, we have more endangered species here in San Diego than anywhere else. And that's a really terrifying thought. Uh, the only place that actually is worse off than we are is Hawaii. And that is because it's an island and islands are very uh, sensitive to any changes that are happening out there. So um, I don't know, it's not a good thing to say we're number one or even number two in this case, but. We do have some problems and uh, that's something we all need to be aware of. Um, all right, so moving out of that, let's get out of the bummer stuff and get into the fun stuff. So what is a bird of prey? Uh, bird of prey are also known as raptors, sometimes called hawks, falcons, eagles, and owls. Um, you'll hear me use the term uh, back and forth between bird of prey and raptor, um, but a bird of prey is a much broader term uh, it's usually referred to any bird that hunts. Well, if you think about it, there's a whole lot more birds that hunt than raptors, than those hawks, falcons, eagles, and owls. Under a broad classification of a bird of prey, you could consider a hummingbird a bird of prey because they eat insects. They do catch insects. So we're going to be focusing on the raptors, the hawks, falcons, eagles, and owls. Um, but you'll hear me use those terms back and forth, and that's perfectly acceptable. Um, to use in everyday speak. A um, couple of the common traits, and we're going to go through uh, that um, uh, those here in just a second. All right, so as I said, we're going to use my buddy uh, Tonka here as our demonstration. So let's zoom in on a couple of these parts and start talking, to, first of all, about the talons. So talons, these are the main uh, tools that a raptor bird of prey will use uh, to catch their prey. Uh, four toes with a very sharp nail on each one. And um, they are designed to grab, hold, and really uh, dispatch their prey. Um, if you look at Tonka's feet here, if you look at the ones that are to the right, those are her back toes. Those are very special to toes on raptors. They are actually thicker and longer, uh, both the nail and the toe, than any other of their, of their toes. Uh, it's got a special name, it's called the Halix. And in the case of a golden eagle, that Halix is designed when they grab their prey, usually something like a jackrabbit, they take that toe and that toe uh, contracts and it goes up underneath the skull or through the skull of that jackrabbit 
and uh, penetrate, penetrates the brain and that's how they dispatch their prey. Um, if they can't get a good hold up by the head, then they just sit there and they basically use all those toes and they start squeezing and they're basically puncturing all of the internal organs. And uh, it's a pretty quick and efficient way to, uh, to dispatch your prey. Um, so how much pressure do they have? That's a great question um, that I get a lot. And um, on a bird, a small to medium sized bird, say let's call it a, uh, um, a great horned owl, for example, you're talking about 200 to 250 pounds of pressure per toe, all focused on the point of that nail. So that's why you notice I've got that glove on. So that's a, 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 a great horned owl. If you're talking something about like a golden eagle, which um, will catch its prey, fly off with it. They, uh, the ones here in San Diego County have been known to catch small mule deer and actually fly the deer back up to the nest to feed to their offspring. Um, they've got a, a, a crushing, a squeezing uh, prey weight of about 500 pounds per square inch. To give you some example, the strongest people um, if you make a fist and you squeeze it as hard as you can, if you are the strongest person who's got the strongest um, grip strength, you're only talking around 60 pounds per square inch. Um, so very, very effective, very, very uh, deadly tools that these raptors use. The other unique trait about them is they have um, interlocking tendons. So as they are um, putting their, they're squeezing their toes together, the tendons lock over each other and it's actually a more natural position for those feet to be in is to be closed with the tendons holding them closed. They consciously have to think about releasing the pressure. Um, so when they grab a hold of something, usually they've got it. All right, so that's the talons, that's the business end. Um, the next thing is binocular vision. So binocular vision is what you would find on most predators. That means your eyes are in the front. It gives you wonderful depth perception um, and allows you to judge distances and closure rates really, really well. Um, so animals that have eyes in the front are typically predators. If you've got eyes on the side, like a jackrabbit or a deer, um, you are a prey species. By having your eyes further back on the side, it gives you a wider field of view. Um, so you have a better chance of seeing a predator coming at you, whereas the predator wants to be able to focus right in on that spot, judge the distance, know what they need to do, okay? Um, a curved, sharp beak. Um, all right, so that is basically a raptor's knife and fork. Um, we think about owls eating their prey whole. Um, they do much of the time, but they don't have to. They have the ability to rip and tear off big chunks of meat and eat it that way. Um, but they, owls will often eat um, prey hole and uh, eagles will take big, big, big bites of meat. I've watched Tonky eat some really large things um, in, in bites and it just is amazing. But the, the, that uh, beak is their knife and fork. It's the best way I can describe it. All right, minimal sexual dimorphism basically means that males and females look similar. Um, often their markings are almost exactly identical. The only way to tell them apart is the size. In almost all cases, female raptors are larger than male raptors. And uh, if you think about it, that makes sense. The females need to carry the eggs. So that's, that's pretty much the only way to tell them apart in some cases. Um, they do eat meat, as I mentioned a number of times. They usually hunt their prey, but most raptors will scavenge as well, which means if they find, if they're hungry and they find something dead, um, they will happily pick it up and eat it. Uh, that's different than being a scavenger. So a bald eagle will scavenge. A bald eagle will find a fish on the river lake and will happily eat that dead fish without having to catch it. A scavenger is something that is only going to eat um, something that's already dead and may occasionally eat, uh, catch something. So something like a California condor, which we'll talk about later, are primarily scavengers but if they're sitting there um, and the opportunity presents itself, something small comes along and it's within uh, grabbing distance, they will absolutely grab it. Um, they're not gonna pass up a meal. All right, so those are some of the common traits of our raptors. 
Okay, here we go, back to high school. So phylogenetic classification. Um, animals are grouped based on common characteristics. So that's changed from time to time uh, over the years. As it says there, um, early on, they were grouping animals based on their appearance. Uh, then they decided they're going to use the jaw structure. And then they decided they would use the foot structure. And um, eventually they went to the genetic markers. And um, genetic sequencing is now basically rewriting the story of how animals are related to each other and how animals are classified within these groups. Um, and it's probably going to be the final chapter in how we classify uh, living things. The, uh, the fun thing, the interesting thing is you notice basic appearance, why would you go to jaw structure? Why would you go to the foot structure? I always like to tell folks, um, I think it's because the geneticists or the, the people who had the job is doing classification, um, they were just trying to make sure they had job security. So, you know, if we, we class, we put this all out and we're like, okay, we're done. We don't have a job. So let's find something else. So for those of us who've been in uh, informal wildlife education for a long time, it, it's always been a very interesting and unique thing about, oh, this animal's no longer related to this one. Why did, what happened? How did that change? So uh, those of us in the education field are very happy with uh, genetic sequencing. Um, but one of the interesting things is um, it's telling us a ton of new information about animals we didn't realize. So my example here is the new world vultures. Um, if you look at uh, a vulture here in North America, you look at an African vulture, an Asian vulture, uh, uh, vultures down in South America, they all have very similar characteristics. They all look very similar. Their, their sizes are different and their colors are different. But for the most part, they all look very, very similar. Um, when we got into the genetic sequencing, what we discovered is that uh, new world raptors or new world vultures, which are your uh, things like the turkey vulture, the California condor, the Andean condor, the black vulture, those type of birds that are found here in North America, Central America, South America, Canada, etc. New world, they are actually more closely related to storks and, um, and other birds like that that are more wading birds than they are to the old world vultures, so the African vultures, the Asian vultures those vultures are actually more closely related to uh, raptors. So a bit of an interesting thing. This is an example of divergent evolution, uh, convergent, sorry, convergent or coming together evolution. So two different species filling the same niche, changing over time. Okay, so with that said and that in mind, let's talk about phylogenetic classification. I'm just gonna do this real quick. I just want everybody, so when I'm talking a little bit later on, your brain's kind of spinning back there. Hopefully you all remember that mem from uh, high school, junior high school, where you had to learn uh, King's play chess, et cetera, et cetera. I don't even remember it anymore, um, but let's go through that real quick. So we got our kingdom. So kingdom is the top, and that's typically divided up into living things and non-living things. And uh, again, they are, con and we'll talk to this in a second, but well, it's kingdom, phylum, class, is this sounding familiar? Maybe. Uh, order, family, genus, and species. So some of that may sound familiar. We're gonna be talking a lot down in the uh, order, family, genus, and species groupings today. How, how these raptors are related to each other, um, things, similar differences, things like that. Um, so additions, deletions, and subgroups. So I think this is how those folks who classify living things, um, they're maintaining job security. So they are always back and forth. Um, they've added things like domain. Domain is above kingdom. Uh, domain is basically living or not living. Okay, well, let's start that classification there then. Uh, deletion. Uh, they're talking about removing the family grouping from this list. And uh, finally, subgroups. So you have subspecies. You may have heard of that term before. You've got subgenuses, suborders, things like that. Um, again, this is, we're hoping that as they continue to do more and more genetic sequencing, we're gonna, we're gonna clean this all up. And, and for those of us in the education end of things, uh, it's gonna make our life a whole lot easier. All right, so let's look at birds, prey, raptor classification. So kingdom is animalia, so those are animals. 
uh, phylum is chordata. So those are animals with a backbone. Uh, class is aves. Aves are birds. And then when you reach that order level, things start to divide out. So you've got the strigiformes, which are owls, falconiformes are your falcons, and ascipidiformes are basically everybody else. There will be a quiz on this later. I hope you're, you're getting the spelling down. And I uh, hope your Latin's up to speed. Okay, so let's look at bird of prey classification. And sorry, it's a little bit grainy here. Um, but if you look at the very top, it says land birds. And uh, the land birds break off into all those different uh, groupings, still again, right up at the very top. Um, you can see land birds are all, uh, you've got perching birds and parrots, falcons, et cetera, on down the line. One of the interesting things that a uh, family tree like this will tell you, hopefully you can see my mouse, is that the order that they're listed here and the length of these arms tell you how related the birds are to each other and how long they have di been divergent from their common ancestor. So one of the things I'd love to point out is look at falconiformes. These are our falcons, right? We talked about them as being in the bird of prey. They sit in here with parrots and perching birds. They all have a common ancestor. Whereas you look way down here, here's your Sipitiformes and your strigiformes. So here's your hawks, eagles, vultures, and their relatives, and owls. So these guys down here are actually not closely related to falcons. They do have a common ancestor way back here, but um, they are diverted, uh, diverged out from that common ancestor a long time ago to have these different uh, groupings. All right. So enough of that high school science stuff. Well, mostly most done of that. Let's talk a little bit about what we have here in San Diego. That's what you all are most interested in. Um, when you see raptors, you typically see them one of two ways. Um, sometimes perching if you're lucky. And here in San Diego, if you see something perching and it's a raptor, 99% of the time, it's going to be a red-tailed hawk. Um, if it's not, the other small things we'll get into a little bit later. But the most common way you're going to see a raptor is by them flying either overhead or near you. And so I've got these uh, wonderful silhouettes. These are courtesy of the World Center for Bird of Prey. And it's a great way to just look at the differences between them. So if you only get a flash of a second, you can kind of, of that bird as it goes overhead, you can get a sense of what it may or may not have been. So the easiest one, first of all, to look at is, let's look at the falcon. Very long pointed wings. Falcons are meant for speed and the long pointed wings means high speed flight, little drag. Um, you get into the vultures. Uh, look at the kind of the size of the body compared to the length of the wings. So vultures are typically soaring birds giant, giant wingspan. We'll talk about vultures more in depth. Osprey. Ospreys are great birds. They're easy. Typically, if you're by the water, that's where you're going to see them, a, a large body of water. But notice how the wing goes forward. It hits a point, and then it starts to come back. It's a very defined point to it. So those are our osprey. Owls. Great big, giant wings, very thick wings, very stubby compared to the width of the body. So look at the owl's body versus the vulture's body. Look at the width of the wings versus the width of the vulture's wings. So owls are not great soars. They can glide, um, but those big, giant, fat wings give them a lot of lift. So when they catch their prey, they will often fly up to a tree with it. And it could be a large thing that weighs as much, if not even a little more than the owl does. They're able to fly back into a tree with that prey and eat it in peace up there. Versus a falcon, narrow wings doesn't give them a lot of lift. So falcons almost always eat their prey on the ground. Okay, so over to the right hand side, kites. We do have a couple of kites here in San Diego. Look for that uh, big giant tail. Look at the shape of that tail and a very elliptical wing. Notice the wing, very elliptical. Um, when you get into the hawks and the eagles, these are going to be very difficult. Uh, eagles sometimes have a more of a wedge shape than the curved shape of a hawk. Um, but 
one of the best ways is, is looking at these fingertips, these, these tips out here. These help them with soaring, they help them gliding, make them very, very maneuverable. And we'll talk about them again a little bit later, why those, those fingertips are important uh, when we get into really the vultures, because the vultures are best known for them. Um, so those are kind of some of the way eagles, I uh, think again, we'll look at the very pointed head versus more of a round head. But um, eagles are going to be much larger than the hawks. That's gonna be your best bet on what you're looking at. Okay. So we're going to start off our, um, our talk today on the owls. And um, so what I want you to think about is there are basically two types of, of owls here in San Diego County. You have the Ticonidae, which are the barn owls, and the Strigidae, which is basically everybody else. Um, all right, owl characteristics. When we think of owls, what do we think about? We think about great big giant eyes, we think about silent flight, and um, that's really about all we know. They're out at night, right? Um, so sometimes we think about an owl's head turning round and round and round and round. Um, they have the ability to turn their head about 270 degrees in each direction. So about three quarters of the way around, both left and right. So if you've got an owl that's got their head all the way to one side, and they whip it all the way around, so back to the middle and then back 270 degrees, it really does look like their head is spinning round and round. And they can do that because the bones in their neck are very smooth. There's not a lot of bumping and grabbing to them. So it allows them to, um, to turn their head very smoothly, very quickly. Um, so that's one of the things we think about. Giant eyes, perfect for um, night, hunting, right? Very little light out. You want to be able to see those big eyes taken as much light as possible. Um, the other thing that owls are known for is their sense of hearing, right? If you can't see at night, you want to be able to hear what's happening at night. And most owls will actually um, start their hunting mode by listening for prey. So they may hear a mouse walking through the grass 50, 60, 75 feet away, just that slight rustle of the grass will cause them to turn their head. The other unique thing about the owls is that they have asymmetrical hearing. That means one ear is higher than the other, one's up, one's down. Um, so when they start to turn their head a little bit, they can almost immediately pinpoint where that sound is coming from. I like to reckon it back to um, listening to the ice cream truck. I'm a big ice cream fan, I'll admit it. Um, but if I hear that ice cream truck, I start turning my head back and forth. I'm trying to figure out where that sound is coming from. And it takes us a while, okay, fine, an ambulance or a fire truck or a police car coming down the road, same thing, right? We're listening, we're, we're turning our head, we're trying to figure out where that sound is coming from because we want to react properly. If it was an owl, a half a turn of their head in either direction, they would know immediately where that sound is coming from. So great eyesight, uh, great sense of hearing, um, silent flight, their feathers are very, very soft. Um, so the air is actually cushioned on their feathers as they're flying, and they have little tiny fringes on the edge of their wing, and that allows the air to break up as it goes over their wing. So it keeps their, the sound to a minimum, and it's actually at such a frequency that we can't hear it, and it does, the owls can't hear it, so it doesn't impact their hunting. Um, they have done studies where they've blindfolded owls, don't ask me how, but they did, and uh, owls were able to successfully hunt just by listening to their prey. So that uh, you don't want a lot of noise coming over your wings if you are hunting by your sense of hearing, uh, your, your ears. Um, so great eyes, great hearing, uh, silent flight. The one thing that owls lack is a sense of smell. That's actually a really good thing. Uh, we think about owls, we think about them hunting mice or rats or maybe gophers or you know a squirrel here and there, something like that. But uh, larger owls, like our great horned owl friend here, uh, catches much bigger prey. Um, they will catch things like skunks. So if you are catching a skunk and you fly up to your tree with it and you're going to eat this skunk, it's too big to eat in one bite. You're gonna have to sit there and tear it apart to eat it. So guess what? If you don't have a sense of smell, that's actually a good thing. You can eat that skunk and it tastes just fine because your sense of smell is directly related to your sense of taste. 
Um, if you've ever tried this experiment, you'll know what I'm talking about. If not, I challenge you to do this tonight, is um, when you're gonna have something that's got a lot of flavor to it, before you take that bite, pinch your nose. Hold your nose closed, take that bite, start chewing the food up, and you'll notice there's not a lot of flavor there. You'll, you'll get some, but not much. As soon as you release your nose, lots of flavor comes back. So your sense of smell is really related to your sense of taste. So by not being able to smell, you can eat a skunk just fine and it tastes great. Um, all right, so this is the family tree for owls. Uh, again, lots of different things up here, but the one I wanna call out is Tito alba, way up here at the top. This is the barn owl. This is one of the most common owls we have here in the United States uh, and here in San Diego County. Um, now, the thing to notice with the, uh, with the barn owls is they have nobody else on their family tree to you get to the common ancestor, all right? The number up here, 13.6, that times 4.3 down here at the bottom tells you how long they have um, been broken off from that common ancestor. So 13.6 times 4.3 in millions of years gives you roughly 55 million years barn owls broke off from their common owl ancestor and became uniquely uh, a special type of owl. And uh, I've got a barn owl I'm gonna bring out here today. You'll notice uh, he looks very different than what we think about when we think of owls like our great horned owl friend here. Okay. And then you go on down the list. Um, so uh, I'm looking for my friend here. Uh, Otis, these are the screech owls we'll talk about here in a moment. Bubo virginianus, this is the great horned owl. Okay, so that's the other common one we have here in the county. Um, so this is all of the barn, this is all the owls we have here in San Diego County. Uh, most of them are permanent residents, others are migratory. So we'll take a quick look at them here. Uh, our most common ones, so the Western Screech Owl, that was one of those Otis owls. Okay, the burrowing owl, unique owl species in that it does truly live in burrows where its name comes from. Uh, they, they don't dig their own burrows, they'll go in and take out a, a, a ground squirrel burrow. Go in, find a ground squirrel in there, great, there's some food, uh, somebody left food in your brand new home for you, but they roost underground. Uh, there's our barn owl, uh, that's one of Project Wildlife's animal ambassadors, he's uh, looking at you sideways. Um, just making sure uh, you are okay, and our great horned owl. So as you can see between the barn owl and great horned owl, very different in appearance, never mind the fact that uh, he's got his head turned sideways. I just like that picture. Um, okay, not so common ones. So we got the flammulated owl, another very small owl, kind of like our screech owl. Northern spotted owl, northern sawwit owl, the long-eared owl, and the short-eared owl. And um, everybody, when I start talking about this, anybody who knows raptors goes, there is no way we've got northern spotted owls. Those guys are up there in the Pacific Northwest. We had that whole lumber thing, cut down the old growth forests. Um, that's not going to happen. Um, we don't have them here. Uh, same thing with the northern sawwit owl and the long-eared owls. Those are all northern species. Um, we would definitely not have them here. Um, however, this is a northern spot, spotted owl chick that was brought into Project Wildlife in August of 2013. So not only do we have northern spotted owls here in the county, they're also nesting and breeding in the county. So we have, like, this goes back to that, such a unique and diverse environment that we have. Our local mountains are perfect for these guys. So um, we're, yeah, we've got them. Uh, all right, so we're going to talk a little bit about my friend Casper, and uh, Casper is one of our animal ambassadors, and he is a barn owl, as um, you may or not have been able to recognize from that picture. Uh, I'm going to bring Casper out here in just a second. I'm going to leave this picture up while I go get him out of his uh, carrier that I brought him here today, and uh, my friend Carly is going to come in and help me with camera work. So I'm going to leave this picture here while I get him out, and I will then uh, stop sharing my screen. All right, 
folks, sorry for the camera jiggling. We are gonna try to get you a little bit of a closer look of this handsome devil. I did not have coffee this morning, so I shouldn't be too shaky. <laughs> All right, so this is Casper. All right, so a couple of things I really want to point out about Casper. Uh, first of all, take a look at his face. Um, he's got what is often described as a heart-shaped face. Uh, that is another unique trait to uh, owls. Their, their faces are actually rather flat. In this case, there's two separate plates, uh, one on the right, can't see me, but one on the left. So it's basically divided up on either side of his, uh, his beak there. And what that does is that with all those white feathers directs light into his eyes and sound into his ears. So if you look at the uh, side of his facial disc where that kind of heart shape drops down, he turns around, he's busy watching the other bird. Um, that is where his ears are. So his ears are on the side of his head. As I said, one is up high, one is down low. Uh, the other thing I want you to notice about Casper, this is, uh, barn owls have one of the few raptor species that there is sexual dimorphism. So we talked earlier that saying the uh, raptors really lack sexual dimorphism. Barn owls have it. And if you look at Casper's chest here, you'll notice it is basically white. Um, if he was a female, a girl, he would have all of these beautiful little black dots all over his body. He would have those on his chest as well. So a real easy way to tell the difference between a male and a female um, barn owl is by looking at that chest. If you see the little polka dots all over this chest, it's definitely a female. So a um, couple of things about Casper, uh, his history. Casper came into Project Wildlife uh, many years ago. Uh, it's been about five years now. And uh, he came in with a nest full of other barn owls uh, that had been cut out of a tree. They were uh, roosting up in a palm tree and somebody had trimmed, uh, trimmed the palm tree and that nest with the barn owls came, uh, came crashing to the ground. So he was in there with, uh, he came in with a bunch of his siblings and Project Wildlife took great care of these guys and was able to get all of the siblings back out. They were all eating, they were all active, they were all showing uh, great promise. They were able to get all of them back out fairly quickly, except my friend Casper here. Casper was not reacting well. He, uh, he wasn't eating all that great. He, um, he just wasn't responding the way his siblings were. And uh, we started doing a few tests and discovered that he was a very sick boy. And uh, we couldn't quite figure out what was going on. We tried a number of different treatments to get him to respond. And um, he just wasn't doing it. He ended up spending about a year and a half in the rehab system uh, till we were able to get him healed up. And it turned out he had a couple of different things going on and it was finding that proper combination of medication uh, to get him to uh, recover properly. So he did recover, he is fully, uh, healthy, flighted, 100% uh, mobility. But the problem is he now thinks people walk around with mice in their pocket. Not a good thing for a wild owl to do because I don't think you'd want to be in your backyard and have a barn owl come and land next to you and start begging for mice. So he, uh, he became one of the Project Wildlife uh, Animal Ambassadors because of that, uh, that ability or that problem of thinking that uh, people have mice. Uh, he's also very, very used to people which is another problem. We want animals that we're putting back into the wild. We want them to, to stay clear of people. We don't want them coming down, looking for food, looking for handouts, anything along those lines. So unfortunately, Casper just wants to come to people for food. So um, that's, uh, that's pretty much Casper. I'm gonna turn around, give you guys a chance to see his back. So a great way to spot these guys um, is with that beautiful dark coating in the back and that uh, opposite camouflage, that white is, believe it or not, and you know, uh, <laughs> that white is actually a great way to spot these guys. So at night, you may hear them vocalizing uh, and you'll see them flying overhead. And they, um, you, all you'll see is that white belly, the white underside of his wings. His wings are white there. Um, so it'll be a white shape going across the sky, maybe with some vocalization, but most of the time not. 
And that's where Casper got his name. If you all think about uh, Casper the Friendly Ghost, the cartoon, um, these guys are sometimes known as ghost owls, uh, but that term really belongs to, um, to uh, the, uh, the snowy owls, which are really, really white birds. So anyway, that's Casper. And I'm gonna go ahead and put him back and we'll keep going. And we're gonna clean up the floor here. <laughs> Excuse the camera movement, my friends. I think we'll get you all set back. Andy, perfect. And if anyone has rodent issues, the barn owl box is a great main way to get those rodents uh, under control. Get, yeah, get those rodent, that rodent populations under control without having to use poisons or glue traps. Oh, fun stuff. Is he early? Here, we'll go just a little bit. All yeah, right. so the problem with poisons and glue traps is when you do that to a uh, bird of prey, to, a, uh, to a, a rodent, you end up with um, uh, poison in that rodent. And then guess what happens? The raptor ends up eating it. And now the raptor's got that poison in there. So um, it's not the best thing to do. So barn owls are great. Um, they, uh, they can eat as many as 12 different, uh, 12, 12 uh, mice, rats, gophers, whatever it is, they can do that at night. So uh, very, very efficient predators. Okay, so we're gonna keep going. I'm gonna jump back into the presentation here. All right, so back, back where we left off with Casper. Okay. Come on, there we go. All right, so we're gonna move now into falcons. Uh, we have uh, two species of falcons here in San Diego County. Uh, or two, there's two families of falcons, sorry. No, we're not in county yet. Um, one genus, uh, the Caracara, and the other genus is Falco, which is basically everybody else. The Crested Caracara is a uh, bird found in Mexico. So far, they've not made it north into, um, the US, but they're there. So one of these days they may actually be joining us. This is the um, family tree and Falco basically is all of these guys down here uh, towards the bottom, there's my mouse right down here. So those are the typical Falcons we think of. Um, uh, the Caracadinidae, sorry, I can't speak my Latin this morning. Uh, those are your Crested Caracaras. Uh, and then these are a couple of other guys. All right, we do have uh, five species of falcons that call San Diego County home. Again, uh, three of them are year round, two of them are uh, winter. Uh, you'll notice with the Merlin, it says winter to year round. They are a migratory raptor and yes, raptors do migrate. Um, but uh, we have seen quite a few of them uh, staying year round here in the county, uh, setting up territories. And so we are, um, we're fairly certain they're, they have colonized in here and they would be considered a native species at this point. All right, so let's take a look at them. So the American Kestrel, this is a tiny pint-sized uh, falcon. This is, again is one of Project Wildlife's um, animal ambassadors. Now it's just my head, huh? Okay, Carly's fixing the screen. Hi everybody, if you can see me. Sorry guys, I'm just trying to get this. Oh, yeah, perfect. Put it at the wall <laughs> and the ceiling. That's the way I like. Nobody sees me. I prefer it that way. All right, that's probably good. I'll sit up. There we go. We should be good. <laughs> Thanks, Carly. All right, so we have the American Kestrel, uh, the Peregrine Falcon. Uh, this is the falcon that most people think of when you're thinking about falcons. Uh, we get prairie falcons. This is a Midwest species that comes out here uh, mostly in the winter. Uh, the Merlin, that's the one I was talking about and the gear falcon. Uh, gear falcon is another northern species that does migrate down this way. Um, so those are our five species of falcon. Um, the thing with falcons, when we talk about them, we think about falcons, we think about speed. Um, I mentioned on their silhouettes earlier about the, the narrow wings, the long pointed, it gives them that speed. And it gives them speed not only across the ground, but also in dives. 
And falcons are known for their amazing uh, diving ability. Oops, let's leave it here. Um, so the, the peregrine falcons have been clocked at amazing diving speeds. So um, they, uh, they can attach transmitters to the feathers, the uh, tail feathers of, of a uh, peregrine falcon, doesn't impact their flying at all. Um, put these guys into high speed dives from altitude and um, they have clocked them at speeds of up to 280 miles an hour. So almost 300 miles an hour are the fastest peregrine dives that have been recorded. Um, stop and think about that for a second. I am sure every person who's on this call has at one time or another, either put their hand out the window of a car and felt that air pressure or stuck their head out to look out the window, whether it's because your windshield had frosted over or it wasn't defrosting fast enough or who knows what, but you probably have, even as a kid, put your head out the window of a car to feel uh, the air on your face. Um, a lot of force with that air, even if we're not traveling very fast in that car, um, air has resistance to it. Air slows you down if you are falling. There's something known as terminal velocity, and that's the fastest speed that an object that is falling can reach. And that's about 120 miles an hour for most objects. So if you've got terminal velocity of about 120 miles an hour and a falcon diving at speeds of 250, 280 miles an hour, that's a pretty significant difference. How do they do that? Well, they actually do that by shifting the shape of their body. They compress it, they turn it into a very sharp uh, aerodynamic shape, and uh, it allows them to slip through the air molecules much more efficiently. Um, if you think about it though, great, now you're going super fast. How are you gonna be able to see? Because I can tell you 300 mile an hour air blast at your face, you're not gonna be able to see, you're not gonna be able to breathe. So they have some very unique characteristics about them. Uh, they have like what all raptors have, which is called a nictitating membrane. It's a third eyelid that they can close over their eyes. It comes from the side and it works just like swimming goggles. So they can actually still see as they're diving at those speeds, which is pretty amazing. Um, and it's dives and it's even flat out across the ground. Uh, the Merlin can go 60, 70 miles an hour flat out across the ground. Um, and again, you have the air blowing on your face that hard, you can't see. So that nictitating membrane closes, you look like you're looking through goggles and um, you're good to see. But you can't breathe. Um, think about that air hitting your, your nose. And if you look at these guys, you see the little dots on their beak, those are their nostrils. Um, the, the little black dots on the yellow around their beak, that the yellow part's known as the sear. It's, it's the top of their beak and the black dots are their nostrils. So if you have, and it's right out front, so if you've got 300 mile an hour air blowing into your nostrils, you can't inhale, while well, your lungs are gonna be inhaled for you, you're not gonna be able to exhale, which means you can't breathe. Um, falcons have you adapted to that by having what's known as a tubicle. Tubicle, and I'm gonna use my gear falcon here, it's kind of hard to see, but right, if you look right in the center of their little nose, their, their nostril, there is a tiny little dot. And that's actually a, um, a, a, a bony structure inside their nostril. And what that does is that forces the air to slow down as it's entering their nostril. And so even in a dive at 250, 280 miles an hour, falcons can still breathe in and out normally. Um, we've learned so much about how these guys operate at high speeds that we've used it in our uh, aviation world. So if you think about the, uh, a fighter jet, you think about, um, I love to use the SR-71 if you know what that airplane is, giant cone on the front of the engine. And that cone allowed that airplane to go, you know, three and a half times the speed of sound because it slowed the air going into the engine. If you tried to run uh, air coming in at three times the speed of sound, you know, 1,500, 2,000 miles an hour into that engine, the air is moving so fast through that engine, it won't combust and it won't work. So you use that tubicle, or in this case, a cone on the front of the engine to slow the airspeed down. So that's just one example that we've learned from uh, birds of prey. 
tons and tons of stuff. Um, and falcons are just amazing. They're some of my absolute favorite uh, birds of prey raptors that I've, I've had the pleasure of working with. Um, okay, here in San Diego, we also have an osprey. Um, these guys are typically found down along the beach. This is an osprey that uh, Project Wildlife had a, a few years ago. Um, take a look at the feet. Giant, giant feet. They're re they're, they almost look too big for the bird. And that's because these guys catch fish. And the big, large feet with lots of scaling on them, both on the top and the bottom, allows them to grab onto that fish long enough and hold onto it long enough to get those talons into the fish's body. If they just tried to hit it with their foot, uh, the fish would slip out before they could even get the talons in. So the scaling on their feet, which you can see in a little bit in that picture, um, allows that, gives them just enough friction to slow that fish down so they can grab onto it before they, um, before the fish swims on. So the osprey, look for them down. I see them a lot down in, uh, in Mission Bay um, on the bridges and things like that. They're sitting up on the light poles, gets them nice and high so they can look down on the water. Um, their eyes are adapted so that um, they can um, get, uh, see through the reflections on the water and see the fish below. Uh, so there's our osprey. Here's a picture of an osprey carrying a largemouth bass. Um, all right, so the family is Cipidrae, uh, largest, most diverse group of birds of prey, 263 recognized species, kites, harriers, hawks, eagles, uh, and the vultures also sit in here. So we're gonna look at each one of these uh, groups separately, but 263 species. Um, so this is the largest group of raptors out there. Uh, there is your family tree. Uh, we're going to start off with the vultures. New world vultures, we've got the turkey vulture and the California condor. And a lot of people go, California condor, huh? What? Um, I call it a migratory bird. Uh, they are currently being released in uh, Baja, California, and up north of us, north of Los Angeles. We have seen birds from Baja come into San Diego County uh, when California condors are about three years of age. Uh, they go on an expeditionary flight, and that's a common thing that they all do, where they will travel thousands of miles looking for new colonies to hang out with. And if they don't find it, they turn around, they fly back to their home colony, but if they do, they're going to stay there. It's how they keep the genetics diverse. Um, so we do see occasionally see California condors in here. Easiest way to tell the difference between a California condor and a turkey vulture is looking at them when they're flying. First of all, the California condor is almost twice the size of the turkey vulture. So turkey vulture, you're looking at a five foot wingspan, California condor, nine and a half. Massive, massive bird. And then when they are flying, take a look at the underside. Condors almost all have the uh, numbers on the bottom because they are all being tracked and studied um, by a number of different organizations, San Diego Zoo, uh, US Fish and Wildlife, Los Angeles Zoo, a bunch of other organizations. So the numbers are pretty much a good uh, giveaway, but you'll notice on the condors, they have white here in the front and the turkey vultures have the black. So it's black with gray for the turkey vultures and white and black for the California condors. So kind of a way to tell them apart. Almost always what you're gonna see is a turkey vulture uh, here in the county. Uh, close up there on my, my condor friend. All right, moving on to kites and harriers. Uh, we have the white-tail kite and the northern harrier. Um, so the white-tail kite, you'll see these guys uh, in kind of open fields, open grasslands, and they get the name kite because they hover. They're flapping really fast. Their tail is uh, fanned out like you see there, and they are hovering in midair. What they're doing is they are using um, UV trails left by rodents to mark where they're going and how to get back, a little bit of urine. Um, well, the urine reflects in ultraviolet light, which whitetail kites see. So whitetail kite is basically following the trail of urine left behind by the rodent. And where the uh, light is more intense, it's a fresher urine. It allows them to find their prey uh, that way. And so you'll see them hovering. They'll drop down a little bit. They'll come back up kind of a new angle. They're checking out that reflection. Um, so and that's how they're catching the prey. Uh, and then our Northern Harrier, uh, grasslands of Vermona is where you're mostly likely gonna see these guys. These are a grasslands hunter. Uh, okay, hawks. Uh, the Cipeter genus uh, gives us two of them that are very 
familiar looking to each other. They look very similar. Um, and they are the ones that you'll most often see in your own backyard. Um, these are both bird eating birds. And so if you are kind enough to put out a bird feeder or a bird bath, you've set up a buffet line for uh, shark shins and cooper hawks. And uh, they thank you for that. So a quick look at them. Here's the shark shin and here's the coopers. Uh, the brown for the coopers, the gray for the shark shin. Uh, I, I use two very distinct pictures here, um, but their colors are often closer than that. Um, you'd think brown and gray would be easy to tell apart, but sometimes, but really they are not. Um, so you have to look at them in flight. And so with the coopers on the left, round tail versus a square tail or a notch tail with the shark shin. And the wings are straight, slightly bent uh, when they're gliding, whereas the shark shin has that uh, really big bend for their wings. Um, another way to look at them is you look at the location of their eyes. You got to be real close to using binoculars with this um, and also the shape of their head. You'll notice on the uh, coopers, they've got kind of a crown up there, whereas the uh, shark shin does not have that crown. Uh, you'll look at the tail, um, white band versus no white band and the way their tail is uh, fanned out. You'll notice the coopers is much more symmetrical much rounded versus the shark shin. So a couple of tricks to keep an eye on them. Usually they're flashing by so fast, I'm like, hey, uh, yeah, I don't know what that was, but hopefully it'll land and I can, I can spot it that way. Um, so but then we get into the genus Puteo. These are the broad wing hawks. These are the soaring hawks. They are the larger hawks, the ones that you're most likely going to see sitting out, sitting around watching people. Uh, usually on the side of the freeway, up on a light pole, especially if you drive along the 52. So we got our red-shouldered hawk, we've got our red-tailed hawk, our zone-tailed hawk, and zone-tailed hawks I see only really in the spring, and usually they're hanging out in a formation of turkey vultures. So if you look at a big colony of turkey vultures soaring, and you look up and you see one that doesn't look like the other, and it's got that zone, that white zone there on its tail, that's a zone-tailed hawk. And then we've got a ferruginous hawk, or a ferruginous hawk, depending on how you want to pronounce it. Um, I like to show this picture because this is a, a friend of mine took this picture up at uh, Lake Cuyamaca. Uh, this is a female red-shouldered hawk, and it's got a mallard duck. So I can tell you that mallard duck weighs about twice to three times what that hawk weighs. And she has just picked that, she just killed it. And she's picked the thing up off the ground. She is flying back to the nest to feed her chicks with that, uh, that duck. So this is a, a really unique picture. Um, but these guys, that broad wing gives them a lot of lift. I talked about it with the owl. It works the same with these, um, these hawks. All right, so this is my friend Quapai. And I'm going to grab Quapai here real quick and uh, bring him out for everybody to see. And I know my friend Carly's coming. Um, but with Quapai, um, he is a unique fellow. So Guapai came to Project Wildlife now 16 years ago. He uh, came in as a juvenile bird, uh, one to two day old, along with his sister. And um, they were both found at the base of a tree in Alpine. And um, they both have the exact same congenital birth defect. They are blind in their right eye. So I'm gonna bring him out, bring him close to the camera again, give everybody a chance to see him. And I'm gonna point that out to him. <laughs> I don't know if you can hear him talking in the background. He, uh, he loves to talk. He's a talker. Come on, bud. Right what did you do in here? What did you get going on here, bud? Sorry, he, uh, <laughs> He has managed to tie himself up. I don't know what he did or how he did it. Give me a second here. <laughs> um, for anybody who's ever worked with raptors, you're going to see me here work with a bare hand by his feet. And I'm okay doing that because I have worked with Popeye since he was 30 days old. Um, I have complete trust in him. And he has complete trust in me. Very good um, relationship. Otherwise, I would never, I, 
I don't even know what you got going on there. <laughs> what did you do? <laughs> One of those mornings. One of those mornings. Okay, well, we're just going to go like this. <laughs> I don't know what he's got going on. He's, he's managed to tie his, his equipment up in a giant, giant knot. So, All right, so here he is. He's fluffy. He's like, you've been bugging me. Quit playing with my feet. Um, you can tell that this is a great look at his feathers back there. That's how you tell when you've got a an upset uh, red-shouldered hawk. They put that crown up, and they give you attitude. Um, so this is Quafi, as I was saying. So let me get his, uh, let me turn him a little bit. I don't know if the light's good enough. There it is. There you go. Um, you'll notice the size of his eye. He does have a cataract starting. He is an older male. Uh, take a look at that eye versus the other one. There was a great look at both of them here a second ago. You can see there's a significant difference. So that right eye, he is completely blind in it. it uh, he cannot see out of it all. He's never been able to see out of it all. So he and his sister both had that same congenital birth defect. Um, basically mom recognized at a day or two old that these two would never survive in the wild. And because of that, she chucked them out of the nest. It's a tough thing being in the wild uh, and probably laid two additional eggs. So I uh, don't know why they had that, that issue, but they did. Um, if they continue to have, if the female continues to have uh, chicks with problems, she's gonna go find a new male. She's not gonna stay and breed with this guy anymore because there's something not right. So they do understand that. So um, this is Quapai. I just wanted to bring him out real quick. Um, great way to tell the difference between him and a red tail. You're going to see the red tail sitting on the fence. I've got some pictures here. Take a look at his tail. You can see the color, the bands on it. That is a dis very distinct way to tell the difference between a red shoulder and a red tail fox. So look at the bands there. Look at the banding on the back. He's got the, the bit of color to him. The red shoulder, they get that name from that beautiful orange color here on their chest. All right, he's, he's not having any of it. So I'm gonna put him back before he, now that he's settled down. We always try to end on a positive. And since he's settled, I'm gonna bring him back. All right, let's go back, bud. <laughs> and due to COVID everyone, a lot of our animal ambassadors have had a nice little break as well. Andy has an excellent relationship. And um, quick note is that all these Project Wildlife ambassadors are highly permitted. They all are on Project Wildlife's permit. So that's the only way we're allowed to keep them is that they provide educational purposes for their cousins in the wild. So although it may look really awesome to have these animals around, it's definitely only because they cannot be released back out to the wild and they're on our permits. All right, so Excellent. here you go. Thank you, Carly. All right, I know I'm running along here, folks. Share with me or bear with me. We're getting towards the end. All right, so that's Quapi there. Um, okay, so going back to, I was just talking about telling the difference between the red tail, red shoulder. So uh, on the left are a couple of pictures of a red tailed hawk. Notice you don't see that banding on the back like I showed you with Quapi, much darker in color. And then take a look at the chest in that this middle picture. It's a very light color, almost cream colored chest versus that bright orange. So when you're seeing them, you're only gonna have a moment as you're driving past on the freeway on those light poles. If it's got all of that beautiful white striping, that's a red shoulder, uh, a dark color, bright red tail. You can see a little bit down here. Um, those are is a red tail and you're more likely to see a red tail sitting out on a uh, highway light pole or a sign than you are a red shoulder here in San Diego so okay going back to our eagles we do have two genuses of uh, eagles here in the county we got the bald eagle and the golden eagle uh, both of them are year-round they're residents they breed here regularly uh, we got our bald eagle. Everybody sh hopefully recognizes the bald eagle with that beautiful white head. And then the golden eagle, like my friend Tonka uh, from before. When you've got a juvenile bald eagle, they look very similar to golden eagles. Uh, the difference is bald eagles are going to be usually closer to the water and they're going to live in a much larger family group. Golden eagles will occasionally allow the previous year's offspring to hang out, but that's going to be it. 
Um, they're, the parents are gonna chase them off uh, after about a year. They don't want them around. This is their territory, whereas bald eagles, you often see them in large groups. Um, so uh, Lake Henshaw, Lake Cuyamaca is a great place to go look for bald eagles. Golden eagles, you're looking for places where there's lots of room. Um, so the San Pasqual Valley has got some amazing cliffs in it uh, between the valley and Ramona. And they do uh, have a couple of pairs of nesting golden eagles in that area. And as I said, um, they have done studies on golden eagles here in the county. They've actually found uh, mule deer uh, bones and parts and basically uh, the remains uh, in some golden eagle nests. So these are very powerful, very impressive raptors um, able to pick up a young mule deer, which probably weighs four or five times what a golden eagle weighs and uh, carry it back up to a nest. All right, uh, as I said here, typical Southern California golden eagle. You can see how big Tonka is. Uh, she stands almost three feet tall. Look at that picture on the right-hand side from the tip of her tail to the top of her head. Uh, around nine pounds, lots and lots of attitude on her. Um, they are amazing birds. Um, they are, uh, it was an honor and a privilege to get to work with her. And um, yeah, so that's Tonka. She, uh, she's was up at the safari park. She uh, was pushed out of her nest as a sibling, uh, as a young bird, and uh, had a severe break to her hip. And she spent a long time in rehab up in the Los Angeles area, uh, trying to get rehab to come back, but her hip never functioned right. Um, so that's kind of her backstory. Um, I've used a lot of references, a lot of photos in this presentation. So here is a bunch of places that I have um, I've used, thank you so much to all of these different uh, areas, uh, references, things like that. So with that, that is the end of my presentation. And uh, Carly, I see we've got a few questions if you wanna yes. ask up my way. For sure. So one of them was that Walter said they're both red tail hawks and red shoulder hawks that live in his backyard. Do you know why they don't fight with each other? Um, typically, they're not competing for the same food source. Uh, red, red shouldered hawks are have some of the most diverse diet of any raptor species. So they will uh, eat anything from crayfish and frogs all the way up to small mammals. Uh, red tails are eating things from small to medium sized mammals up to uh, larger mammals. So if they're not competing for the same food source, they're going to tolerate each other. Best way to tell the difference is the red, red shouldered hawk is going to be screaming its head off year round to let you know they're very vocal birds, whereas the red tails are much more quiet. So, um, yeah. <laughs> That's a great question. Um, we had one from Jasmine that she said she lives at the top of North Park, right on the edge of Mission Valley Canyon. She often sees falcons soaring, hunting on the edge of the canyon. She thought they were prairie falcons because they seem smaller than a peregrine. Oh, wait, I think this was a typo. But she's, I'm seeing them throughout the year, not just in the winter. What species do you think they're? I think she said she meant they're bigger than a peregrine. Yeah, it, it, is, it, poss it is entirely possible it is a prairie falcon. Um, they're, as I said, San Diego is a great place. People like to move here. People want to stay here. Uh, we have a lot of raptors and, and other animals that do the exact same thing. Um, as I said, the, the Merlin's a great example, and I've, I've always used the Merlin because, um, you know, I've known that they've been colonizing San Diego County for a number of years. So it is entirely possible we've got uh, year-round residents, and I've just not heard that. So okay. interesting. Thank you for sharing that. Um, do ospreys stay in family groups? I have never seen osprey in family groups. They, uh, a lot of raptors, they will pair bond for life, but they don't stay together for life. So I talked about the red shoulders. Um, they've got documented cases of, of pairs of red shoulders on the East Coast coming and staying together for, you know, 10, 20 years um, using the exact same nest site year after year after year. When they leave, off their offspring take it over. Um, so we know that they do come together, but they don't stay together throughout the year. They only come together for breeding season. Um, so that is, um, that's entirely possible. Uh, it's, sorry, it's most likely that they are not in a family group. Um, I'm thinking about the pair that breed out at Lake Murray every year. Um, they, um, and that's where that uh, osprey came from, by the way, was out by Lake Murray. Um, 
they, uh, you'll see them breeding, they're taking care of the young, and then poof, they're gone until the next breeding season. So um, I, they don't typically stay in family groups to the best of my knowledge, long story short. Um, Mary asks that she says, we hear Cooper's hawks calling constantly for days at a time. Do you know what's going on? Breeding season. <laughs> That's usually it. They're calling for a mate or they're doing territorial call, one of the two. So if they've got somebody in their territory they don't want in there, they're going to be very vocal. Um, or if they're looking for a mate, they're going to be, they're going to be calling. But that's usually the only time that they're vocalizing. And then we have, what's the safest way to keep rat population down without harming the birds? Uh, as Carly mentioned, barn owl boxes are great. Um, there's a lot of information about barn owl boxes. Um, I know Project Wildlife's got some. Um, but set up a barn owl box, it's going to take probably a year or two before a, a pair moves in. Uh, but once you do, you will never have a rat population again or a rodent population again, I can tell you that, because they, uh, they will take care of everything, not only at your house, but in the neighborhood. And we've also started suggesting raptor perches too. So if the barn owls aren't yeah. coming around, you might get some better luck with diurnal guys. Um, yeah. But yeah, just like we mentioned, the poisons just have such a harmful effect up the food chain. Um, and this year, we've seen some really bad cases from the glue traps that have been set out. So glue traps tend to catch every other animal than what you've intended it. And even when a mouse or a rat gets stuck to the glue trap, it's quite a inhumane way for them to go. So more humane deterrence, different scents, prevention is key. So right now, as we're starting to cool down, um, it's a really good idea to start looking around the house, look for any openings the size of a dime a mouse can get into. So cover it with wire mesh as much as possible. So you prevent them from coming in in the first place. Um, and then when, if you do have an issue, we try to recommend some more um, scent smells. So eucalyptus oil, tea tree oil, peppermint oil, um, cayenne pepper. Um, so just kind of assaulting their senses so that they don't, it's not comfortable for them to be um, in the property or around the, in the house. It's going to be your best thing for them. Um, one says, if we do put up a barn owl box, will they kill all the songbirds that come to the yard? Typically not. Barn owls are not um, bird eaters by nature. Um, it doesn't mean they won't, but typically they are going after mammals. Gotcha. And that's what someone else just asked. Will they hunt baby ducks and birds we feed in our backyard? No, if not so much. Uh, that's the coopers and the sharp shins. Uh, <laughs> and maybe, maybe a red shoulder. But yeah, cooper sharp shins are our primary bird eaters here in the county. All right, friends. So I don't see any more questions. I just see a lot of great presentations, Andy. Everyone has really enjoyed it. Um, we have one that says, you mentioned, oh God, I can't ever say, giant gear falcons. falcons. Gear giant falcons, falcons or gear falcons, depending on how you wonder. Um, I have seen them here in the county. Um, I saw one out in uh, the greater San Pasquale Valley area, um, only from a distance, but yes, we do have them here. They're not year round yet. Gotcha. All right. Let's take one more question. Uh, how about chickens? Do red tails eat them? Well, there's a reason they're called chicken hawks. <laughs> so um, yeah, that, that would be a potential. So I would say if you've got chickens, always keep them in a coop or always keep a cover over, you know, you can give them a large coop, large area, uh, but keep it covered because if they're not, um, you know, we do have peregrines and peregrines will take a chicken and you know, there's there's so many other things that might go after your chicken. So keep them keep them covered. And then let me go back. We had a question about what's the average lifespan? Would you say of a oh say so? What's the average lifespan of hawks, falcons, and eagles? I know it's a little broad. It, it yeah, <laughs> it really depends on the species. It's very very broad. Um, you know, the smaller raptors, shorter life, they got a lot of predators out there themselves. You know, it could be 10 years or less. You can go up to uh, an eagle, which could go 40 to 50 years. You could go to something like a condor, which they know go at least 65. And they only know that because that's how long they've really been studying them. So um, they're breaking records every day in, in books. So um, it really, really varies. Uh, Quapai, for example, he's going to live probably to his mid-20s. 
uh, Casper probably mid to late teens. So it really, it varies widely by species. Gotcha, great. Um, will the rodenticides that will still be legal next year negatively impact raptors? Um, so that was actually, so what the bill that was passed is to do a reevaluation of the secondary rodenticides, um, secondary generation rodenticides. So it's still very possible rodenticides, no matter what, are probably not going to have a great impact on um, wildlife. But I know there's first generation and second generation. So what that um, bill that was passed is that they are going to reevaluate the effects of the second generation. Um, and but there's still quite a large amount of um, organizations that can still use it. So it's not quite gone away yet, but hopefully they'll be doing their due diligence and making sure that we're not putting too many harmful um, poisons out in the environment. Um, we have a question on what happened to Quapai's sister. Well, uh, she unfortunately passed away. We don't exactly know the instance because she was no longer under our care, um, but hawks and birds in general do a really good job at hiding any ailments or diseases. Um, it's just a natural defense that they don't look weak in the wild. So usually when um, an animal or a, a bird ambassador is starting to present issues of non-eating um, or food flicking or just losing weight, um, Sometimes things have already progressed to the point where they can't be helped out, unfortunately. To answer um, your question, Mike, no, thank goodness. <laughs> Mike's question was, has Casper started his mating cycle? Um, Mike is another one of our volunteers who has another one of our barn owls, and it looks like Boo has started already, which is probably a really fun time for Mike because they get very vocal during this time. <laughs> it's great in the spring when Casper is going all night and uh, Quapai is yelling all day. So it's nonstop fun at my house. Oh man. Neighbors love me. Oh, the joys of housing animal ambassadors. Yep. Um, oh, I don't know about this one. We have a question. Um, are gluten pellets for rodents safe for birds? Not a clue. I don't know either. I'll have to look at, I'll have to look that up. I didn't even know there was a thing called gluten pellets. I know. I'll do some research. But you stumped the uh, host, so therefore I think we're, uh, you know. <laughs> we don't know everything. We're always yeah. learning too. <laughs> all right, everyone. Well, thank you all so much for joining us today. Like I mentioned, this webinar is being recorded. We will upload it um, to the website in a few weeks. Um, but like I mentioned, the bat presentation will be coming up this coming week. So check that out if you missed it last month. But thank you, everyone. Enjoy your weekend. Stay warm. And we will see you all hopefully next month. See ya. Bye, Bye. everyone.